Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we're just waiting for everyone to come in. While you're waiting, if you'd like to put your name and where you are in the country in the chat or anything about you, we'd love to know so that we can have a look where you're from, like what you're doing at the moment. Um, be lovely to know who's here. So, uh, yeah, please just write your name and stuff in the chat. Let us know. We can say hello to you. Um, we are going to start in about 30 seconds, I imagine. And um, right, the only thing, okay, so perfect. Okay, so I think we're going to start now. Wonderful, thank you. Um, perfect, wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, so um, welcome to all of you. Um, it's really, really lovely to have you here for our very first Mass Creative Access Masterclass of 2021. Um, it's always a pleasure to host these events and welcome to all of you here. We've got a really uh, eclectic mix of people that should be joining us. We've got obviously some of our amazing current creative access interns and hopefully some of our alumni too. I believe we have some of our participants on the Set Access um, program and also people from Penguin Random House who are taking part in that um, mentoring program and also some of our partner universities. So I'm hoping here that we've got people from Kingston, from Goldsmiths, from UAL, from UCA and hopefully lots of other places. So let us know where you are and we'd love to hear. Um, the other thing I'm just flagging at the beginning just while I'm talking to you is please do follow us on our socials because we'll be, it'd be lovely to, if you're able to tag the event and our tags up there. So um, just for the benefit of those of you, if this is your very first ever masterclass. My name's Josie and I'm one of the founders of Creative Access. Um, we are, our mission is to support people from underrepresented communities enter and thrive in the creative industries and there's lots of ways that we do that so first of all through recruiting roles and you'll see we've got literally dozens of amazing roles on our opportunities page at the moment but also through lots of employability skills support events like cv clinics and masterclasses like this brilliant one and on the subject of masterclasses we have another couple of brilliant events coming up we're actually in a, a vaguely related note next month we've got um Kwame Kweyama, who is the artistic director of the Young Vic Theatre, in conversation with one of our one support alumni, Olivia Nwabili, who is actually Kwame's uh, assistant. So, though she was a, an, a, um, a creative access intern at another organisation, that is taking place at a slightly later time, at five o'clock on the 25th of February. And we're continuing with a brilliant programme. So, watch this space. We've got events with The Guardian, we've got another one with the Manchester International Festival, lots of exciting things taking place this year. So on that note, um, I'm going to stop talking and pass you over to our speakers today who are we're really excited about. Um, Sign Digital is a, re is a leading digital marketing agency and we're really thrilled to be working with them. Um, Benji, who I'm going to pass you on to in a moment, was actually the marketing director for one of my favourite ever shows that I've sometimes quite often got the the soundtrack stuck in my brain for and hopefully you will too which of course is six and he was their marketing de director for I think over three years from when they were a tiny kind of almost amateur production to when they became the global phenomenon they are now I think Benji said they've had over three million um, watches on TikTok if I'm not mistaken and James too James used to work in the music industry um, and is now like consultant to loads of major theatre producers like including our partner Sonia Friedman who produces things like Harry Potter which I'm sure lots of you have seen um, and DreamWorks and lots of others so we're really really thrilled that James and Benji have come here today and that you um, and to have the benefit of your skills and expertise and I'm really you know we've been really looking forward to this so um, without further ado over to you uh, Benji and James. Thanks so much Josie. Um, just let me know if you can't hear me at any point or if we have any internet issues, as I'm sure there will be, there always are. So yeah, as Josie said, uh, we're assigned digital. Um, we're a digital marketing um, specialist agency who have actually only been around for three years. Um, so we've got a bit of an index here as we might share this to anyone who wants it afterwards. There's some good facts in here, I think. Um, so just briefly, as Josie mentioned, I'm the managing director of Sign Digital. I started the company three years ago uh, and Benji joined us. Benji, when did you join? In November. November, yeah. So uh, post coronavirus uh, and Benji's had an amazing experience working in the West End before that. 
But we don't just work on West End shows, we actually work across entertainment, leisure and fashion as well. Um, we've got a name for us working primarily in arts marketing, um, but obviously since March we've had to diversify a little bit, which I'll talk you guys through. But um, so three years ago, I was actually, um, I was working part time. I was on tax credits, which I suppose now is universal income. Um, and I was working um, as a musician and a songwriter and part time as a, um, as a copywriter for digital marketing articles and SEO articles. Um, I'd worked in the music industry for 10 years before that as a songwriter uh, and a musician, toured around, um, did a lot, of, uh, a lot of gigs, played all the major festivals, uh, released a few albums, had a number of record deals and publishing deals, and really failed uh, after the rise of Spotify, really struggled to make any money in the music industry. Um, our fir first album, we sold 25,000 copies of the record, and I kind of made a bit of a living that year, and it declined from there as the rise of Spotify from about 2009 to the end where I really couldn't support myself anymore as a musician, even though I was working on a lot of exciting projects and getting a lot of streams on Spotify and YouTube. So I actually started my own record label originally um, and started looking after new artists and trying to help people primarily with digital marketing because I could see that the record labels we were dealing with, in particular the major record labels, really didn't understand how digital worked. They were all completely bamboozled by huge numbers and everyone was led by Ed Sheeran has, you know, a hundred million streams on this one song as soon as it goes up or Lady Gaga or whoever, Taylor Swift has billions of views on YouTube and they were so bamboozled by those big numbers that they forgot really what were the building blocks for a career would be. And so with a real interest in that, I actually started Sign Digital on the side of our record label, primarily to support musicians and up and coming artists. And three years later, we've, uh, we've grown from a team of me and a friend of mine who is also a fantastic composer, um, Jake, who's our technology director now. We now have a team of 18 people uh, and we've worked, we've worked across some of the biggest shows uh, in the West End. And we've also worked on a number of music campaigns and, and we're branching out into a lot of other areas. But the, the fast rise really came about from calling out, uh, really calling out numbers that just didn't mean anything and asking people what they were actually trying to achieve. We started off on some music campaigns in 2018 and we had a really great break into the West End where we worked on a number of Sonia Friedman shows who I know is a partner for Creative Access. Sonia Friedman works on fantastic plays but she also works across a number of huge shows and musicals as well. And we got a break to do some social media advertising for her which was just some Facebook ads, a few hundred pounds spent and after she saw the results, she wanted to work with us more. Her company wanted to work with us more. Um, but the most important thing really was in the room, we were really honest and straightforward about what we were trying to achieve. We weren't looking at big numbers, trying to achieve big numbers. We were looking at how do we get the right audiences onto the website to actually buy a ticket. Um, and from there, fast forward 18 months, we'd worked across 25 West End shows uh, and the team grew. And then fast forward to 2020, um, we've launched in the last year, we've launched 70 odd events, Benji, I think, yeah. and worked across a number of big, uh, really big brands as well, because in March, as I'll explain in a second, we, we obviously had to diversify really quickly. So Benji, I don't know if you just want to go through some of the brands that we've worked with in the last yeah, so, year. So just a couple of the brands that we kind of diversified away from, um, entertainment and live theater and music, obviously because of the lockdown restrictions. That were put down in March 2020, we actually managed to work with quite some some rather nice big brands like Porsche and um, De Beers Group, and then but also with companies like Cool Camping who had diversified to obviously really push and strive to you know make their money back in the summer break when people weren't going abroad, and Fame Productions who completely changed their entire theatre model to purely live stream. Um, and Michael McCabe, who is still pushing to get um, Prince of Egypt back on the stage this year. Um, and then other theatre clients that we worked with, we had um, just before lockdown, we obviously was working on Six, which is actually how I joined Sign, because they were, they were working on the digital aspect of Six and making it the success that it is. Um, and it was quite a nice, smooth transition. And then working on you know, big musicals like Everybody's Talking About Jamie and um, and then Back to the Future, which is opening this year and huge plays like Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe and Baby Reindeer, which was becoming quite the phenomenon from 
kind of a, a it was a fringe show that was just taken by storm and then just looking at kind of the theatre insights for 2020 um even though obviously there wasn't so much going on between March and December 2020, we actually saw that between the 50 theatre shows that we were working across, we spent just over a million pounds in media spend, but we were actually seeing an ad revenue direct from the you know, Facebook spend and Instagram and everything else that we were working on of 13 million and selling 280,000 tickets across those 50 shows, which, um, which is why I suppose we can say that we're leading uh, industry leading because I don't think there's any other companies that could have them kind of numbers, especially for the second half of 2020. So just moving on to digital marketing, um, I suppose this is more saying what the webinar is. Obviously the changing landscape of digital is um, ever changing on a daily basis. We constantly are keeping our kind of ear to the ground and seeing what's going on um, and making sure that we're at the forefront of anything that's digital for any kind of campaign as well, from large scale musicals through to the one night events, we make sure that every single client has um, every bit of attention from all the team. So then just looking at kind of jargon buster, I'm gonna leave this with James because he is the expert at this, that's for sure. <laughs> so, sorry, I jumped a few slides there and interrupted okay. you. Um, so what we, we thought, just with that background of what we do, we thought what would be useful for you guys and some of the people who are joining the call, people who are potentially working in new companies or looking for new jobs. And I thought what would be useful from our expertise really is going through the jargon around digital marketing and just trying to break some of that up to have a think about what does it actually mean? And some of the things that people say in meetings or people might even ask you in an interview that might catch you off guard or sound more complicated than it is because it's actually very, very simple. And, and as I mentioned, I, I've been doing this for only three years. Um, I learned very, very quickly and the fast changing nature of digital advertising in particular means that if you skill up and you learn about this stuff, you can actually be industry leading very, very quickly because it can, it basically transforms every three months. So I thought we'd just go through some of the things that, you might have come across um, some things that you might get asked in a job interview or some things that you might be able to actually look at in terms of analyzing a company that you might be talking to um, so that you can point out some things and be a bit ahead of the game or maybe stand out as a candidate. So one of the things you've obviously all come across is social media um, and everyone's probably on a social media platform or more than one social media platform. One of the biggest, um, misconceptions around social media and the social media platforms want, want it to be this way is that people think that you can just post regularly and build and build and build something into a huge following because everyone's heard the success stories of how these small companies went on Facebook originally or got on Instagram, built their companies up from nothing uh, without spending any money. That's actually what the social media companies want you to think because it's their business model. So how Facebook started was you built a small network around you of your friends and you'd post things and the reach of when you posted something, it would go to all of your friends. Now, when you started businesses on Facebook, which originally people didn't start businesses on Facebook, they just created a fake person that was the business. Facebook then launched pages um, and it was, that was actually very disruptive. I was in, I was a musician at that point and we had a, a we had a, a page, a person for our, for our band that had thousands of people that followed it and Facebook suddenly launched pages and we had to try and move everyone to the page, which we lost thousands of people on it. And these sort of changes obviously can be really disruptive. Part of that was because Facebook were inventing the business model that now all social media uh, platforms follow, which is, and anyone who's on TikTok will know this now, you start off by basically, if someone posts something, they get a load of engagement in a young social media platform. As the platform gets older and you get more and more followers, let's say you're a brand in particular, or you want to be an influencer, as you get more and more followers, you'll find that as the social media platform gets older, it gets harder to reach those followers and your organic engagement starts to decrease. Now, Facebook, a really established platform, has around a, an organic engagement of about 2%. So if you have 100 followers and you post something, two people are probably going to see it and that's it. So if you have a million followers, all of a sudden the numbers are nowhere near as impressive as you as if you hoped for. So what Facebook do is they allow you to reach those followers, but only if you pay. So you have to pay to either boost your post or run some paid, which is organic versus paid, run some paid advertising 
to reach the people that actually want to follow you in the first place. That's how Facebook make their money. Now, Facebook get a really bad rap because they kind of invented this, but they followed this, they bought Instagram and they followed the same model on Instagram. Everyone found really early on on Instagram that engagement was great and it was a great platform to be on and that you could get followers really quickly. People you never met before following you and liking your comments, liking your photos. You're seeing now that that is starting to decline as they move towards that original business model and TikTok are now in the infancy of this engagements through the roof you can reach people really quickly you can grow huge followings without spending any money then moving towards this paid model so one of the things you might see when you go and i'll try not to spend too long on this sorry well one of the things you might see when you go for a job interview or you look at a company is them getting this completely wrong and posting way too many things getting very little engagement wondering what's going on posting regularly instead of posting quality sorry the bike going past um, and actually not getting a proper balance between their organic and their paid strategy, which is something you can learn about really quickly and could be really impressive in a job interview because everything's there for the public. And particularly when you go to talk to a new business, you can see exactly what they've been posting, what they've been doing. And I think actually, even if your job you're going for has nothing to do with digital, the fact that you're looking at the overall company and their, their business strategy can be really useful. Um, so just some of the some of the platforms that you'll obviously be aware of, most of them, TikTok, absolute meteoric rise in the last year. We'll get onto that a little bit more in a bit. Facebook, the world's largest social media platform. I'll give you the numbers on that, which will blow your mind as well in a minute. But Facebook own Instagram and Messenger is its own, um, Messenger actually is its own social media platform. So Facebook Messenger and Instagram Messenger merged. The original plan was that Facebook would merge WhatsApp into that as well. So Facebook bought Instagram, they bought WhatsApp and they're creating Messenger because the rise of Messenger bots is going to be really, really big in the next few years. So whenever you go on a company's website, you're likely to not make a phone call to speak to that company. You're going to talk to them on a Messenger bot. Um, Messenger through Facebook will be a big part of that. And Facebook had been making moves to merge WhatsApp into that group, but it's been blocked by the US government and because it's, we're getting into monopoly territory. Some people are very surprised by the fact that Facebook actually owns so many of these huge platforms that we use every day and, and aren't even aware of it. But then there are the, the other platforms as well. Twitter, always in the news because obviously it's the mouthpiece for a lot of people, including uh, an awful US president. Uh, Snapchat, which um, huge boom before TikTok to Gen Z, but is actually still a major platform. And a lot of people from Gen Z still use it for, uh, for chatting with their friends, TikTok more for a public image. Um, Pinterest, of course, really held its own over the last few years in terms of ex exploratory, but really great for fashion and really great for uh, interior designers and artists and great places to share, um, to share boards and different, um, different uh, montages of things that are tastes. And um, it's another one that really could have fallen away when Instagram launched, but it's held its own. And then LinkedIn, it's not an enormous platform, but it is quite a powerful platform for businesses. And it's a great way if you're looking for a job or even when you're uh, in, your, in a new job, LinkedIn is a great way to get in touch with other businesses. It's a great way to actually a replacement for your CV instead of having a CV online to actually just have a really solid LinkedIn profile. And it's a great way to reach out to people as well. So just to give you some numbers. Um, so Facebook is the world's biggest social media platform. Um, it's 2.7 billion users worldwide. Um, absolutely enormous amount of users and probably quite shocking to a lot of people that that's the case. Um, and then as you go down from that, the second one is WhatsApp and WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. So you can imagine really the power, the power in the user data that Facebook have on their platform. The amount of information that they have on people is, is uh, apart from Google, probably the most information that any company has ever had on anyone in, in history. Um, YouTube third, YouTube is owned by Google um, and, for, you know, and falls in as part of Google search and all of their um, infrastructure. Facebook Messenger on its own uh, is, a, is an enormous platform, 1.3 billion users. And then WeChat in there, which might surprise some people, and some people might not even know what WeChat is. And WeChat is essentially the biggest social media platform in China. And WeChat is, WeChat is changing the game globally in the same way that Facebook changed the game after they took over from MySpace as the world's leading, leading social media platform. WeChat is more than just a social media app. It's actually almost like an operating system for your phone. Once you're in WeChat, you can do absolutely everything that you could do on any of the social media platforms that we've mentioned. But you also have things in there like security, your bank, 
all the stuff that we would have on an iPhone or an Android phone in an app, you would have it in WeChat and it makes it one of the most powerful social media platforms in the world. And when it breaks out into the West in a bigger way, it is going to completely change the way that we use our phones. Um, Instagram up there, of course, TikTok, enormous rise. That's 1 billion users um, in the West, but you'll see their Doyan and Doyan is actually the Chinese version of TikTok. And that's 600 million in China and a billion worldwide. So they're actually 1.6 billion TikTok as a global um, app. So really, really influential app. And you'll see some other ones in there as well. QQ, QZone, and they might, might not be familiar to you, but they're all actually owned by WeChat. And they, like Facebook, are it's a company called Tencent who also make video games. You may have heard of Fortnite, which is an absolutely massive video game. And Tencent are actually one of the biggest uh, investors in Fortnite. So you can see there, just as Facebook, as we were saying, are a really, really powerful company, one of the most powerful social media companies in the world is Tencent that we don't talk about a lot in the West because it is Chinese based. Um, TikTok have been getting a lot of the slack recently because they're having such a meteoric rise in the West, but Tencent and WeChat are the ones to watch for the next few years. Um, QZone and QQ are also owned by Tencent. QQ is, um, is like WhatsApp, but it has an amazing translator built into it. Um, and QZone is kind of more like a blogging and personality page where you can keep your own, keep diaries and uh, very customizable like MySpace used to be. Telegram on the rise, um, as you guys may use in Telegram, people consider, some people consider it to be more secure than WhatsApp. Uh, and then Pinterest, Reddit, Snapchat, and a lot of people are always shocked to see how small Twitter is in comparison. Twitter takes up a lot of media time. We talk about Twitter a lot, but actually in comparison, it has 300, uh, around 300 million users worldwide where Facebook has 2.7 billion. So you can really see there that the Twitter really isn't as powerful as many people think, especially in compared to in comparison to some of the Chinese um, companies that are coming through. Um, so there's some stats on here. I'm really conscious of time and uh, I've gone off a little bit there. So I'm going to just whiz through some of these for you. But basically, if anyone wants to have these slides, we're more than happy to send them over. They're not confidential, uh, but there's some really interesting information in here. Um, and they basically lay out some of the changes that have happened uh, over the last few years. So that's social media. So just to go through some of the other areas of um, sort of jargon busting in um, in the workplace and in businesses and the type of digital advertising and digital marketing that people can do. There's paid search, which is often called, often called PPC, which stands for paid per, per click. Um, and Google is obviously the place that people use PPC the most. Um, but there's also Microsoft advertising platform as well, which was known as Bing. Um, so there are other search engines out there that, which also do PPC. PPC is basically this ad that you can see here on the right. You search for something and the advert comes up as if it is the most relevant thing for the search uh, that you've just made. Now on a mobile device, often what you'll see, what we call above the fold, above the fold in old print terms is where the fold is in the print on actually on the newspaper. If you're above the fold, it gets seen first. If you're below the fold, it's the second thing you see. It, we still use that terminology in digital marketing and above the fold on a mobile phone, you can see that you only see ads most of the time when you search for something on Google. This is how a lot of businesses really generate um, huge amounts of interest in their websites by you bid against something like a, you know, a search term that you deem to be relevant for your company. You, you basically tell Google how much you're willing to pay for it and Google charge you per click. Um, some terms like insurance, if you want to bid on insurance, you can pay £30 per click, for example. It can get really expensive. And then other uh, niche things where it's something that's unique to your brand, it can be much, much cheaper. Um, display advertising, you will all have seen display advertising when you've been on websites. Websites basically either charge directly to advertise on their site or you can take advantage of the Google display network or another big network, which is called DB360, which is part of the Google display network. And then there's a number of other um, publishers that essentially allow you to, through the platform, publish things onto these sites. So you would have seen above, you know, newspaper, any articles that you've read online, there's often advertising on there. And that's how a lot of websites actually get paid. One of the phenomena that happens, though, is that basically most people discover news now, either through social media or through Google search. And so newspapers have kind of overstated for a long time the amount of traffic that they get. When I worked in the music industry, the NME, for example, would always want to charge tens of thousands of pounds if you wanted an advert on their website because they used to charge a lot of money when the 
for the enemy was really popular in print and they charge a lot of money and they try to translate those costs onto their website and it literally led to the downfall of the publication because really they the traffic that they were getting with people in facebook let's say they see an article in the enemy that their friend has shared they click on it they read it they leave the magazine and come back so unlike in the old days where you'd browse the whole magazine and see all the adverts you're just seeing that one page and leaving and so it actually led to a lot of major publications struggling um but what you will see if you go on something like the daily mail a company that done very well in terms of actually making money from digital advertising when you get to the bottom of the page you'll see a lot of stuff that is just a lot of nonsense it's a lot of clickbait things things that seem unbelievable or you know uh, one i saw yesterday was uh, tragic photo tragic selfies before someone died and a picture of someone hanging off a cliff taking a selfie they're just trying to make you click on them because they get paid when you click on this stuff um, and that's that's actually your sort of pay-per-click stuff within display advertising um, but we thought just for fun there, we'd show you the first ever display ad. So that went up in 1994. I can't remember the stat, but it had something like a 95% click through rate, because as you can see there, it was the first clickbait. Have you ever clicked your mouse right here? And most people clicked on it because they didn't know what it was. Um, click through rates now are well under 1%, you know, like 0.03%. But the first ever display had had over 90% click through rate. Um, more display ad formats there. You can see there, that's actually the NME there that I was just talking about. That's a theater ad for a Wicked. Um, we work with Michael McCabe, who works on that show. That's, that's uh, a wrap of the actual whole page, really difficult to ignore. Um, and then you can see there, ads in Gmail. A little creepy fact about Gmail ads that people often don't like is that you can actually, Gmail reads your emails anonymously, so there's no human being that does it but your emails are stored and an algorithm can see what is in your emails. So you can actually search, you can actually advertise to people based on things that might be in their inbox. So if you, if you bought from All Saints before, for example, Gmail can see that All Saints is in your inbox so you could target by All Saints. Um, some other ads in there. Programmatic advertising is the what I was just talking about where you actually, that's, these are the platforms that enable you to put these ads onto any place on the internet. So programmatic buying, if you hear that term, it's actually, um, it just means real time live bidding for advertising space in the digital world. These are all terms that get banded around a lot. If you're applying for a marketing job, for example, you'll hear things like programmatic advertising. And when I first entered digital marketing only a few years ago, I realized in a lot of meetings that people were talking about this stuff and had no idea what any of it was. And a lot of these things are only a few clicks away from reading up and on, and they're very, very simple. There's some amazing YouTube videos. Benji and I are gonna share some uh, potential resources for you if you're interested in this stuff. So you can educate yourself really quickly. Um, but programmatic advertising, because it's real-time bidding, it's of interest because it's actually growing. It's gonna, it's, you can now buy programmatic advertising on smart televisions. It also outdoor sites. So some of the sites outside that are digital screens, you're going to be able to buy them digitally without having to call someone up, print something and then send it over to them like old school media buying. You're going to be able to just bid for them in real time. And so it's going to mean you're going to see a lot more variation on advertising outdoors and a lot more variation on advertising on your smart TVs as well, but also in applications. So if you ever use a computer game that's free, often they'll have um, digital adverts in there. They're booked by programmatic advertising. Search engine optimization um, is another thing that you guys will be, most people will be familiar with the concept of, but again, it just gets called SEO and people in businesses in meetings often just band around the word SEO a lot. Um, you know, we need to focus on SEO. We need to look at the SEO of our business. Again, people talk about it without really understanding what's involved and what, what, what you have to do to work SEO. And SEO, it basically means that on Google or on other search engines, what are you feeding Google from your website to enable you to rank higher? Now, Google is amazing in terms of finding things that are really relevant for search terms. So they will judge your website on website speed, the relevance of your content, whether actually it's a good user experience, and really just basically whether your website is a place where people go to for quality content. So it's a lot involved in search engine optimization. People often think you can push a button and just fix it. You might see if you start your own business or you have a side business or anything and you build your own website, you'll see you'll get probably start getting a lot of spam emails about SEO and search engine optimization. You can't fix this stuff by installing a plugin. 
and just pressing a button. But there's a lot of companies out there that tell you that you can and you can't. It's, it's quite a lot of work to work SEO. Um, so Benji, I'll just pass over to you quick. Yeah, just looking at current trends and so, sort of bringing it back to entertainment in the theatre world, in a kind of a post-COVID landscape, we can definitely see that the pandemic has accelerated a shift towards digital consumers. And I do feel like the theatre and entertainment world was slightly a step behind e-commerce, but obviously commerce in general has shifted primarily online. And with one in 10 customers to be considered as digital adopters and kind of having more faith and trust in social advertising, um, it's certainly going to be the, the way forward for any producers or anyone you know working in publishing or for, for the likes of Netflix, for example, they've definitely led the way in terms of pushing digital first campaigns to you know try and get us to buy into their products. Um, and we can see obviously with the increased use of digital channels, creating the digital footprint like Facebook, for example, having 70,000 touch points alone for each person, we can only optimize going forward and really making sure that everyone's um, kind of digital aim is personalized and sat it basically satisfies their experiences and therefore will improve um, the product services and kind of future buying powers going forward. And then just looking at kind of the digital and traditional um, ways of working, obviously, I mean, print media, for example, I, I can't remember the last time I picked up a newspaper, but I do remember the last time I looked at my Facebook and went on something, clicked on it and bought straight away a product that I probably don't need. Um, so it's kind of definitely become kind of part of our daily habits and lifestyle. And as there's a stat there saying that digital advertising grew by 6% in 2020, whereas traditional advertising shrank by 30% compared to the previous year. So we can see that digital throughout all of the um, generations and demographics from Gen Z through to baby boomers is only gonna grow going forwards. And then kind of just looking at the way that we are being advertised at, we were always, I was always certainly told when I started working in theatre marketing nearly 10 years ago that it should be landscape, landscape, landscape. But certainly because of TikTok and Insta feeds, we've seen vertical video um, rise as the kind of format of choice and looking at how people use their phones and things, you know, 60% of mobile users film on their phones vertically. And we watch our videos, especially on TikTok and Instagram um, in a vertical way. So that um, I'll, I'll kind of pass you back over to James to discuss how we've kind of looked at that in the mobile space. But um, definitely the rise of TikTok has certainly improved our way of working, but also shifted the way that we want to present an advert going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as we said, TikTok is kind of changing things at the moment. Um, I think the most important thing is that it's actually fed into is that we've seen attention span um, through because of digital media and because of um, media on demand over the last decade, attention spans are becoming less and less as we go on. We see that older generations, their attention spans have been massively dented by the rise of digital media, but they're still much, much higher. And the younger generation's attention spans tend to be really, really low. Now, we can see this is a really negative thing, you know, that people don't concentrate on things anymore, but it is actually, it's largely to do with stimulation and basically the amount of things that are out there now, people are actually much more selective about what they spend their time looking at. And I do remember, I, you know, I'm old enough to remember sitting in front of the television with only four channels to watch and sitting watching things I didn't want to watch, but it was the best thing out of the four channels. Now, what we see now on YouTube and other digital platforms is that People don't watch things they don't want to waste time watching things they don't want to watch for very long. So these digital stats can be slightly misleading when you hear that people's attention span is two seconds. But attention span of two seconds means that there's just a lot of things that are being skipped. A lot of people are looking at stuff and then deciding they don't want to look at it. And TikTok played into this really well with their newsfeed. So the newsfeed basically enables you to scroll very quickly through lots of short videos and consume a lot of media in a very fast space. So I think, and also the other thing with the vertical format is that most people use their phones vertically, yet everyone continued to build content, like Benji said, landscape, because landscape is closer to what we're used to with films. 
So a lot of people who got into digital media early on were from the film industry or made films or made videos, and they'd want things to look wide and widescreen. And actually the act of turning your phone on, the, on its side is a put off for people. And you might think, what's the problem? If you wanna watch something, surely you won't mind turning your phone on the side, but that's the point. People aren't sure what they wanna watch. So if you inconvenience them by making them have to turn some, their phone or turn their sound on or do something that they're not planning to do when they're not certain they want to engage with what you've put in front of them, obviously you're gonna get better engagement if the phone is vertical because there's less barriers to viewing. So TikTok have tapped into all of this. You've seen Instagram follow very, very quickly with Reels, realizing that TikTok, that that is actually how particularly Gen Z want to engage with media. Reels now has followed with that. Um, but I think TikTok have got the upper hand, particularly with the way that they use music. The other thing that they've done, which I think is going to be the next game changer, if any of you are interested in the influencer space or are applying for jobs in PR companies or, uh, you know, in actually in anything in arts marketing, this is very, very relevant to you because... TikTok marketer place, marketplace has basically tried to stop what's gone wrong on Instagram with influencer marketing. What we've got on Instagram is basically PR companies or influencer companies as they, they have now established themselves would reach out to an influencer on Instagram and message them directly and basically ask them how much would they charge to promote a product. Um, this obviously has led to bigger influencers who have managers. You contact the management, you agree a price, and that's where we get to people you know, charging hundreds of thousands of pounds just for a post on Instagram. The problem with that is there, the lines became blurred between what was actually a post about uh, a product and was really an advert in that sense, and what was someone's genuine recommendation. So the creator marketplace is basically listing TikTok influencers as creators and the marketplace enables you as someone who's looking to get in touch with an influencer to search for people who are genuinely genuine micro influencers in the space that you're interested in. So instead of going after the person with the biggest follower, you can go after the person who produces the most relevant content. And then you're likely to find someone who is more likely to endorse your product because they actually like it rather than having to appeal to someone who's just got millions of followers and charges a lot because they know they have a lot of followers. The other flip side is what I said earlier about organic engagement, that if you don't spend money on that post, it doesn't matter if you have a million followers, only 2000 people will see the post unless it gets some organic traction or you put spend behind it. TikTok creator marketplace enables you to actually, as the person who's asking the influencer to share your product, you can actually spend money on their post without them having to do it. So you can boost the post to more people. I think that's going to be a game changer. So if you're, if you're going for a job at a PR company or any marketing company, particularly in arts, this is a really good thing to mention in a meeting because I can guarantee to you that most people are not on top of this in marketing departments and it's a really fast changing platform. And if you tell people in a job interview that this is an exciting area of growth, I think people are going to be impressed. And I think often people like to hide that they're not on top of this stuff. People get very busy in their jobs, particularly in marketing. These, these things move so quickly that you can't be on top of all of it. So if you go into an interview and show that you're on top of this stuff, I think it's a really great angle to make people think, I need someone like that in our business who stays on top of these trends. Another major trend that's happening at the moment that I'd say that most marketing people have no idea about is the war between Apple and Facebook and the war between Apple, Facebook and Google that's happening. So one of the major, major changes that's about to happen is the new iOS 14 devices are basically stopping apps. So your application on, on the iPhone, they used to be able to just talk to each other. Now, Facebook have built their business around that because as I said, they launched lots of different apps. They have Messenger, they have Facebook, they have Instagram, they have WeChat, uh, they have, um, I've forgotten the name of it, Benji. Um, sorry, brain's gone. Um, and so basically those apps all talk to each other. And because they all talk to each other, that means that Facebook don't have to actually charge for the apps and for um, something like WhatsApp, where they don't even get your data because WhatsApp is encrypted. So they can't read your messages and they don't advertise to you and it's a free app. So there's no money to be made really for Facebook on WhatsApp, except if the apps talk to each other. So Facebook can send an ID from um, WhatsApp to Facebook or Instagram and use it to find out how people behave. Apple have decided to stop that from happening without customer consent. So you'll now get a pop-up that asks you, do you want platforms to be able to basically share between apps? 
this is hugely disruptive for Facebook. It's going to cost them billions, and already they're having to make moves on what on WhatsApp to change privacy settings, which is why a lot of people are moving from WhatsApp. Now, the other thing that's happening, Apple have launched their own processor called an M1 processor. The M1 processor is Apple's first ever Apple processor, and not an Intel processor on their laptops. Really geeky, I know, but it's of consequence because on your iPhone, you have iOS apps, and then on your laptop, you have Intel based applications. They can't talk to each other and you can't have an, an Apple iPhone app on your laptop. What this new processor is going to allow you to do is have Apple share apps across all of their platforms. So you'll be able to use your iPhone apps on your laptop in the future. But what Microsoft and what um, Google are doing and Facebook are doing is stopping developing apps for the, they're not going to develop apps for this new processor because they're at war with Apple. So there's loads of articles out there on this. It's all really current. And again, if you're going for a job interview, just brush up on, on this stuff. Because if, some, if you're going for a job at a company where they use lots of Facebook advertising or Facebook is a key part of their business, it's well worth mentioning that there's massive disruption coming and asking them, are they on top of this stuff? So if you say to in a job interview, particularly in a marketing department, what are your plans for the huge iOS 14 changes? I think that's a great question to ask because a lot of people aren't thinking about it and it is going to disrupt marketing. Um, I am conscious of time, so I'm just going to whiz through, but we will share this stuff. Um, this is about some strategy and consideration for uh, basically um, for digital marketing. I'm just going to jump through this so that we can um, we can get onto some uh, other bits for you. But there's some best practices here. People often forget that you don't. Most people don't listen to sound on um, social media, so sound is off. So you have to actually make people turn their sound on. Um, you'll see a lot of content now starts with a sound on um, little banner that pops up. Um, and I just want to talk to you about our approach. And again, this is how something that when you get, when you work for a new company might be worth them thinking about. So again, we see people posting things in isolation on social media with no real storytelling plan. And we only get a few seconds with most people on their news feeds. So a really, really important part of actually reaching people is through what's known as micro moment storytelling. So instead of you know, a one minute advert on a television show where you're engaged potentially for a whole minute and you can tell a whole story. Those days are really gone. And we're now looking at six seconds, which is why um, YouTube is five seconds you get on a pre on a, an ad that appears before you watch a video. You, and people find that really scary that you have to tell your whole story in five seconds. And the, the answer is that you actually don't have to tell your whole story in five seconds. You tell micro moments of your story over multiple sections, over multiple seconds. So you know that if you're doing digital advertising, you can reach people multiple times because you're targeting them. So if you can reach them multiple times, you can unpack bits of the story that you're trying to tell bit by bit. Uh, we actually specialize in that as a, as a company, which is, I think, why we've been so successful. Um, here's some of the different types of ads that you can use and some of the different ads that are coming in at the moment. Uh, a lot of AR ads are going to come in. So augmented reality where you hold your phone up and it transforms what you see with your camera. Um, Snapchat kind of pioneered that. There's going to be big developments in that in the future. Um, Facebook's actual shopping is becoming much, much more sophisticated and shopping on Facebook is becoming really seamless. Um, polling ads for brands, another good thing to be aware of. If, you're, uh, if you want to know something about your audience, always just put polls out there because they can be really engaging and people actually quite like doing them. Those of you who use TikTok will know that um, hashtag challenges are huge and they're great ways to get people to engage with your brand. Um, leading on from that, one of the biggest areas that I'd really recommend researching if you're interested in marketing or just if you want to work in arts in general is ocean modeling. And it's essentially what um, Facebook and a lot of the it's what Netflix's algorithm is based on. And it's basically based on personality um, types. Now, ocean modeling is it's a psychological, um, it's psychometrics um, where you basically take people's behavior and you break it down into the very, very basics of what makes people tick and what drives them to action. And ocean modeling has basically laid out that there are five core personality types that make up your personality. And those five things are often called the big five personality types and they're openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. This really is the cornerstone of marketing because if you understand ocean modeling or the big five, 
you really can start to learn how to put creative together for different personality types. And there was a study at Cambridge University, for example, where they worked with a beauty brand and they decided that they were going to test um, whether introverts and extroverts responded differently to the exact same product if you use different messaging. So they had the same image, the same video, but they changed the message. And the message that went out to extroverts was dance like nobody's watching, brackets, but they totally are. And the message that went out to introverts was beauty doesn't have to shout. Because of course, introverts, unfortunately, we haven't got time to do this, but I do actually do a whole, I can do a whole lecture on this as well in terms of ocean modeling. Introverts um, tend to gain their energy from having time alone and extroverts tend to gain their energy from actually being uh, in social environments. And when I say gain their energy, I mean, people who are introverts get exhausted by social interaction, extroverts get really fired up by it. But what Cambridge University found, and this is actually, you may have heard of Cambridge Analytica because Cambridge Analytica actually took some of this data and built their campaigns on it. They found that the introverts and extroverts were 40% more likely to click if the, just the writing appealed to them, just the copy and the message appealed to their personality. And they were 50% more likely to buy, even though the brand, the product and everything else was exactly the same. The only thing that changed was just that message. Um, so another really interesting area to go away and research and a great thing to talk about, I think, in marketing meetings as well, particularly when you're trying to understand personalities, that little bit there is just introversion. And obviously there's five different um, corners of that. So Benji, just going to talk you guys through, we, we didn't want to recommend any co paid courses because actually I've never paid for a digital marketing course in my life. I am actually going on a, on a paid course for psychometrics soon in the next few weeks at UCL University. But we, when I learned about digital marketing, I didn't spend any money getting trained. And that's because actually the major platforms provide so many good places for you to train yourself free of charge. So Benji, I'll just let yeah, you Yeah, and I suppose obviously the big ones that you can you kind of all already know is the Facebook Blueprint certification and the LinkedIn Market Labs. They have so many different courses that you can do. But the one major course which I think everyone and anyone should do um, is the Google Skillshop because they've got the fundamentals of digital marketing certification, which is um, it takes about 20 hours to complete. And it, it literally goes through every single element of digital marketing from the basics upwards. And I mean, I, I, I did it quite, quite early on when it first came out. And I know that everyone in, in our team obviously have done it. But that's the one thing that I, I really push our producers and our clients to, to do as well, just so that they understand what the, the kind of fundamentals of this you know, new digital era is, really. And it really does give you that, that insight into our world, really. <laughs> and then another um, big kind of play world of um, interaction and an amazing place to find out solutions for all kind of the smaller details and problems that people have faced um, when they've been setting up ads or anything in the digital kind of world is um, YouTube. And there's a couple of people that we would highly recommend. One of them for Facebook is Ben Heath. And then if it's for tracking, um, there's a company called The Measure School. And if you want anything on digital professionals kind of background, there's the Ad World Conference. And kind of a pro tip that we've we've kind of added on to our notes is that you should always really watch them in 1.25 speed just because they can they can drag a little bit but they do really really go into detail into um absolutely every element of digital and then just in terms of industry and industry news just always keep up to date with what's going on in the world and it's so easy to to just be signed up to the likes of the drum and e-consultancy just by putting your email address you could set up an an email address that, so that it doesn't go into your usual personal ones so that you can then just have it there. That's what I've certainly done. And it definitely helps if I want to kind of have a moment. And basically, instead of watching the news, that's kind of the news forum that I go to and read my emails instead. Um, and then just in terms of a couple of questions that came through prior to, um, to this session, there was a couple of people who sent in some um, questions, which I hope we've kind of answered throughout this and I know that James has kind of gone into quite a lot of detail on different aspects but one of the ones 
that um, Omalara, I apologize if I got your name wrong, um, asked was, do you foresee any exciting new trends for the year 2021? And I think that kind of TikTok advertising and the vertical way of advertising is definitely gonna be the, the rise. And also the re-emergence of Messenger with the Messenger bots. Um, I think that's certainly gonna be a, the, the next step in um, customer service, to be honest, and really working out what the person wants to you know, purchase or consume, should we say. Um, and then just a couple of other questions. I don't know if you want to answer this one, um, James, about how you can tailor your CV and cover letter to a marketing job to get an interview which was yeah, anomaly. Absolutely, yeah. And I think what I just said before, really about doing that research on different areas and trends and get them into your cover letters. I think it's a really important way to show that you're on top of current trends. But also some of the platforms that Benji just mentioned, if you do the courses on there and they are free, put them on your CV. You know, show people that you're actually out there learning um, on your own. And, it, you, you know, actually, when we've employed people in the past at Sign Digital, we don't, we're not overly impressed by um, university qualifications from five years ago, even if they're in digital marketing, we want to see that people have really kept up to date. Of course, we're, you know, it's great if people have qualifications in, and are specialists, but if they don't demonstrate that they've kept up to date, we found that a lot of people do stagnate, particularly in big companies that don't keep training people. So it's a great way to get an edge on people who probably have really strong CVs is to show that you're really up to date on your CV. And that kind of answers Maxine's question as well. And uh, how do you apply for jobs as a master graduate with little experience? I'd just say upskill, 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 and talk to people, go on things like this, um, talk to potential tutors, universities, current students, graduates, just to get a gra grasp of everything that's going on. And whether, you know, that course or that master's degree is, is the right route for you, or whether there's you know, there's a foundation level that you could do, or there's, um, I don't know what you class it as, it's, it's an internship, I suppose, whether there's any internship, just to really be up at the forefront and to up, up your CV as much as possible, because you can learn and learn and learn, but then actually putting it into practice is where the real work begins. <laughs> and I'd say also just a cheeky tip, I suppose, is I think with digital, it moves so fast, you can be confident that everyone even when you're talking to a director of marketing, always has a little pang, even if they're a digital expert, they have a pang in their stomach that they're not completely up to date because it moves so quickly. And you can use that to your advantage in a job interview. And just from experience within our company, we do have some people who've learned like me very recently and some people who've been working in digital marketing for over 10 years. And I know the difference between those, the two types of person in our company. We have one, the people who've learned very recently constantly have a little knot in their stomach that they're not experienced enough and maybe they shouldn't be making big decisions because they haven't been doing this for decades and on the flip side the people who've been doing it for decades always a little bit worried that are oh, the people who've come in new they're hungrier and they're they, they're reading up on this stuff and they've got more energy for it than i have and they know more than me so everyone has that mix in their companies and that is ultimately what happens with digital it moves so quickly that there's always a little angle that you can get in on to say, I'm up to date and I might even know more than you about this because I'm up to date on it right now. That's certainly how I started Sign and how we got in the room um, with people. So Josie, I think we're going over time, aren't we? So, oh, you're on mute. Sorry, uh, of course I'm on mute. Um, no, it, this is just completely amazing. And we've, I mean, I just know there's so many questions already. So I just wanted to I know I've interrupted you there. Are you okay for me to ask you a couple of questions from the audience that have come in? Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to just kick off. I, Fraser's asked a question, which I really like, which is, which companies' brands would you always keep an eye on in terms of their innovation for um, digital marketing? Okay, well, yeah, I mean, really good question. I think, for me, honestly, watch the Chinese companies at the moment in terms of development. Watch Tencent and watch what's going on with Chinese social media because what's happening in the West is we're trying to break up the big platforms because they have big monopolies and China aren't doing that. So you're seeing Tencent innovate way beyond everything. So if you look at what Tencent are doing with their, with their uh, digital marketing and their digital ads uh, and they're also their digital apps, you can get great ideas for innovation. Um, 
And okay. then and I also mean by that, like, I think, you know, any of the, like, the brands that we're familiar with in, in the UK that are just good at innovating, you know, some of that kind of more household names here, that you think they're really good at it? I personally think if you're looking at fashion, fast fashion is definitely the one to look at. I mean, obviously, just in the news this week with Boohoo buying out Debenhams, and you know everyone like ASOS potentially or whoever buying out um, Topman and Topshop, they are not as precious at kind of testing and refining and retesting. And you know, by the they, they just jump on the trend. You know, they were probably the first kind of company jumping on TikTok advertising to push their brand. And now the likes of Nike, who are a little bit more established, are there and very prominent. So it's definitely the fast fashions because you know it's fast moving really. yeah That's really yeah. helpful there's a question from maxine here so this is i'm going to try and read this out she says um in terms of ar content that you've mentioned that's coming out i know that we do research for it for years but is there one particular company you can see heading that development in the future in relation to the apple facebook google wars that you were talking about yeah i think snapchat have actually led the way in it but i do think facebook and instagram will probably completely take over that that area um tiktok tiktok are, are doing a lot in that area at the moment but i can knowing instagram they're gonna have to find a way to get an edge so i'd really watch instagram closely on that um but they'll be using a lot of the old snapchat technology because snapchat have done some amazing things with brands in the past and obviously as screens get bigger your phone screen gets bigger phones get lighter the experience can become a lot better and then obviously you can add vr headsets into that because we've got you're going to be able to basically have VR headsets on your phone. Really, you can already do it with some amazing cardboard designs, but you're going to be out and about and you're going to be able to put your phone on your eyes and basically have an amazing VR experience. So it will go beyond uh, AR as well, I think. So a lot of what you've talked about, which has been completely amazing, but it's a lot about big brands. Well, if you're a small brand and you're just starting out on social media, Aisha's got a good question, which is what are your three tips for someone who's just starting out on yeah. social media? So we actually work with a lot of small brands. So we um, we have a lot of small fashion companies start up. And one of the big things I think is don't create content. Don't try and do too much. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see, and I see it a lot in the music industry as well, as I mentioned before, the major labels, you look at Ed Sheeran and you say, he's doing this, 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 and this, and this. We've got to emulate that. Brands kind of do the same thing with big brands. So don't be on Twitter if you haven't got anything to say because you're, you're, mate, you're going too thin with your audience. Don't be on YouTube unless you've got great video content. Um, you know, Facebook have made it really easy recently to run Facebook ads and Instagram ads without having a Facebook account. So I think one of the things is know your strengths as a brand. So a brand we work with called Percival Clothes. They're brilliant on Instagram, great with short videos, but very visual. So we push everything through Instagram. And we don't advise them to really go, but we're not, they're not on TikTok just yet. We might get onto TikTok, but I'd say specialize in a platform is the most, most important thing to do and don't spread yourself thin. I also think when it comes to branding, um, don't be precious because social media can change and you, you, can, you can, by the time you've posted something, it's old news almost for your kind of organic route. You know, you can, the idea of social media is perfect because you can refine and test and work out your audience and what works best. And it might be that video works best, or it might be that plain image or just pure text works best. Or, you know, you're, for when it comes to like theatre, especially for me, we worked out that going out there with big glossy stars for six didn't work because it wasn't that kind of show. Going out there with the queen saying, hey girls, like let's let's get on stage and rock this absolutely worked um so yeah, but we had to test and refine that because we had to check whether it worked with you know with the amazing reviews that came through before realizing that it didn't work <laughs> yeah so that's brilliant so i'm literally going to ask you one last question because i know we're running out of time and i know that we can keep asking shafe has asked us how do you keep on top of all these changes? Like it's so fast paced and as you said, it changes really quickly. Like how much time do you actually devote? Do you live and breathe it? Or do you actually like for, for a mere mortal like me, doesn't work in it, how do we stay on top of this? I think you do have to have an interest in it, but I think you can dip in and out to really help your career and your job. And I think it's important to do that. Yeah. I'm fascinated by technology and being a former artist and struggling to build a social media following with all the changes that happened, I wanted to learn about it.
But if you don't have that passion to keep up to date with it every single day, and you know, like Benji said, subscribe to the news feeds about all the changes in tech, then I think dipping in and out is well worth doing. And some of the resources that we shared are great for that. There's really good overviews. And I think just dip in and out every month or so, and it can really help you shape what you're thinking about with your company or what you're thinking about when you're talking in a job interview, because you can always throw those things in. Because as I said, last month, we would have been talking about some very different changes. iOS 14 hadn't kicked in. That's, that's in a few yeah. weeks, you know, so it changes so quick. Well, you definitely blown my mind with some of these stats today. I'm absolutely staggered. So um, <laughs> really, we cannot, can literally, it's just been so amazing. I've been glued to the screen. So thank you so much. Um, I know people have asked for the copy of the PowerPoint. That's fine. We'll follow up with everybody afterwards. Um, and thank you a million times, James and Benji. I know you have so much expertise and it's so valuable. I mean, really, like if there's one skill that we, you know, this generation need, it's digital. So, you know, really grateful for you and brilliant case studies, really interesting. Um, as I said before, please do join us for our next event on the 25th of Feb, 5 p.m. It's going to be a fantastic one as well. And um, thank you again. It's going to be uh, a very abrupt end to the webinar Benji and James just so you know and everybody but um because we have to turn it off but thank you so much um no please so much. please follow us on social media we've got competitions we've got all sorts of brilliant things going on and um I'm sure we'll be hearing more from the crew at sign digital sign it digital and thank you again and thank see you soon bye